Welcome back to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Please like the video and subscribe to the channel. Today's guest is a man that does many amazing things to improve the lives of others and help tackle type 1 diabetes, Mehdi Tahiri. Mehdi, how are you, my man? Good, good. Thanks for having me. Thank you ever so much for having me. Pleasure, mate. How's your morning been? Good, mate. Good, good, good. Work, just, just, yeah, same. Just like same circle of life, work, run, gym, kids. But this morning, <laughs> I'm a little bit tired. I'm not going to lie, but I'm loving this. Awesome. You've been out for a run this morning as well? Not, mate. Not today. Not today? My body's shut down for today. I said, rest day, man. Rest day. So, obviously, we know you locally, mate, and you run a local business. Um, and you sort of campaign a lot for uh, JDRF, yeah. um, which is, I think, the global leader in research yeah. for type 1 diabetes. Yeah. Um, and I think that that research in particular is quite close to home. So we'll yeah, come yeah, on to that yeah. in a little bit. Um, and I think you've got a little bit of a story yourself in regards to how you arrived in Plymouth yeah. and, and everything else, yeah. mate. So I don't, don't know really where to start with you, I guess, because there's a lot to talk yeah, about. Yeah. But should we start from the beginning and, and how you find yourself in Plymouth? Yeah, cool. 14, I was when I moved here. Um, I think I moved here back in September 1998. Came here on holiday a few years and spent. And basically, we were at Terminal 3 Heathrow. I can remember it like it was last year. And then my mum and then my siblings were like, you coming back? I'm like, nah. They're like, you're not getting on a plane? I was like, nah, not this time. They're like, you want to stay? I was like, yeah. So my uncle was in the Navy and he was going through divorce. Um... And he said, you can stay with me if you want. So I thought that is it. That's what I'm going to do. I was crazy enough to make those decisions at that young age. And I said to my mum, I said, like, please let me stay. And she was like, by yourself? Okay, you can stay if you want. And that was it. The rest is history. And it was the hardest decision I ever make. I think as a parent now, I got 13 and a 12-year-old. I... I wouldn't do it myself. I wouldn't let my kids stay 5,000 miles away by themselves with their um, uncle or brother or with the family members. Because looking back now, I was just a street kid. I was nuts. I was. I knew if I go back, I got no life back home in Iran. And the life has been interesting. It's been lots of ups and lots of downs. And But yeah, roller coaster, I call it. Um, I've had it all. I've had it all. Um, from prison to um, catering college to foundation degrees to run a business at 19 is definitely been an interesting one. But we, we, had, we had fun so far. <laughs> to me, the journey's been good. The journey's been good. And you can't complain. Yeah. You can't complain in life. Absolutely. So you grew up in around, did you say? Yeah, yeah, till I was 14. And we used to come to Plymouth on holiday. Why Plymouth? Yeah, I was going to say, why oh, Plymouth, mate? Right? All the places oh, you could no, go in fucking Plymouth. I love all the Janners. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my, my uncle was in the Navy and he settled in Plymouth back in 1978. And we thought, let's just come and visit him. So we came 1992, 1993, 1994, every year, literally for holiday, um, three, two, three months. And I decided I'm going to stay. Life is better. I used to go car boot sale buy for you like Game Boys and stuff and you still take them back to Iran and sell them on. There's fucking loads of people that do that now. Oh, no. I, I had a game shop for years, mate, and you get all the all the Kurdish and Iranians that come and buying PlayStation 3s and 4s and they fucking sell them for a mint back home and they oh, end no. up used to be like, no, oh, you're not fucking God. having them because they used to clear us out. They used to come in, they come in and fucking God. spend loads, man. So my mum was like, how much money you made? I was like, this much. She goes, oh, you're going to share it? I goes, yeah, I share it. I share it with my mum and it was so good same with my siblings because it was just a fun thing to do bought for X amount back home they bought for a lot more mate I know fucking loads fucking more loads more and I was like cool kid back then in, in Iran um, I come over and I thought you know what Iran you don't get freedom you literally one thing you get in over in the UK is freedom you get like you get to be who you are um, and you got a lot more opportunities in front of you and as long as you're crazy enough to take these chances, yeah. you, and you believe yourself, you could possibly make it happen. But back home in Iran, it was almost like, nah, you got to go with whatever they say. You can do certain things. Or it's, it's, it's a hostile environment over there that I thought, that's not for me. My siblings and all that, they went back. But I thought, nah, I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay. Went to school here. 
didn't learn a lot. Fuck me, man. I was suspended and um, kicked out a few times because just that's the type of guy I was. I was just wanted to be in the street and have fun and I was always a worker, you know. Um, and then I ended up basically banged up, for, yeah, for a little while, well, for a few months. Um, but that taught me a lesson. And I've always said to everyone that questioned me, but like my past, I said, guys, that was a path I had to go through to become who I am now. If I didn't go inside, if I didn't, if I didn't go inside, I wouldn't have been a chef. I learned to cook and I was inside. I got my, the only qualification I got from cookery is when I was inside. <laughs> when, I, when I come out and I went to CFE, I didn't even get my qualification because um, I missed so many lessons and stuff. So it taught me a very good lesson. I didn't um, go back in. How did you find it in there? I enjoyed it. A Loads lot. of fucking people say that. Yeah, to me. Yeah, everyone I speak to in prison, it. they're like, yeah, it's all right. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Even though I never owned the PlayStation or Xbox in my life. And when we were inside, if you're a good lad, you get PlayStation. I was like, mate, I'm not into that. I just want to work. So I worked in the savory, in the kitchen, got my qualification and stuff. I come out, they're like, what did you do when you were inside? I said, mate, I cooked. I learned how to cook and I got my qualification from then. The rest is like pretty much, okay, cool, let's get a job here, let's get a job then. My uncle bought this premises, he goes, do you want to run it? I was 19 at the time, I thought, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. I'll give it a go. It was hard because 19, I didn't really know what I was doing. Yeah. I didn't know anything about business. But... It was, the overheads wasn't a lot. So I thought, I'm going to give it a go. Instead of me working for someone else, I just want to crack on and do my own shit. Mm -hmm. um, and it was good, hard work, but I partied hard. I worked hard, I partied hard. And I had a good community. And I always believed in, if I keep my regulars happy, they could come back and they could bring people. Mm -hmm. I wasn't worried about going and getting new customers. And yeah, and it's been my the main ethos in business. I'll keep the people that kind of like support my business, especially the community around me, very tight. And I look after them and they look after me. So that was 19 and 10 years later, we opened up a second one. Then we start doing outside events and going to cook for like different artists. So you've done that for 10 years? Just from, yeah. from 19, you didn't shut down nothing? You no, just no, no, on bed, bed lasted. Bed restaurant lasted 11 years and then we opened Heaven Up and then we went tour catering for three years. Um, that was fun. So you named the artists we'd done. We catered for backstage, toured with them. Anyone from Snoop Dogg to Chasing Status, <laughs> no Ben Howard, Sam Fender, Rudimental, man, you name it, man. We've done it all. Mars Kane, oh, fuck, good, and Storms, you name it, we've done it, but... Nine, 12 years ago when things changed with Scarlet with type 1 diabetes, me and my manager now, Becky, we just had to come up with this idea that we need to change things um, and do something different. So nine years ago, we came up with the idea of fuel um, and we stopped doing the tour catering and artist catering. And um, uh, it's been a nine, good nine years, good challenge in nine years, but it's been hell of a journey because we give people with type one a better hope. We've we've almost turned when you look at our business like page, it's not always you don't always see a picture of food. You don't always we don't always talk about food. We talk about the little the running community, little um almost like community that supports us to raise awareness and funds. But there's loads of good charities out there. And I'm and I'm a big fan of all of them. And I think, but the one that is close to heart is Type 1. And the other local one that we help out is there. We don't, we call it the most vulnerable in the community at Christmas, that we all get together. Um, and we do a big feast mm -hmm. on Christmas Eve and presents. So the business, the fuel itself, the nine year journey, has been helping the community. At the same time, like you, earning a bit of money and you're enjoying it and you're giving back to the community. Make sure you raise a bit of awareness. Make sure you tell people why you started. Make sure you tell people that. The journey was to give hope. The journey was to 
kind of like support the ones that need you. Um, and the message was to care. Um, and it's, if I think if you give and if you give generously, you don't need to um, wait for it to return. You get it returned, mm -hmm. honestly. And I believe it, I'm a great believer of that. Um, and we see it, we see it like we, we help out so many charities. We had a true charity event last night uh, for Crohn disease. UK, and we, we helped them up, give them discount, give them room higher for nothing. Just because I care about the charity, it was someone that good friend of ours and they've been helping that charity that is very close to me. So, um, so we had to make sure they had a good event, we had a good do, but yeah, is the journey has been is, is insane. We we could talk, we could see and talk about all my um, interesting life stories. Mm, we'll definitely but get into a few of them, mate, go for, for sure. It. So when you came to the UK, what age were you, did you say? 14. 14. And how was your English at that time? Oh, shit, it's shit now. <laughs> it's shit <laughs> now. My kids, when I do the homeworks with them, they're like, Dad, you could do maths or whatever, but you can't do English. Yeah. <laughs> I'm that bad. Yeah. Spelling, fucking, you name it, mate. I'm rubbish. We had uh, we had uh, Toby Gorniak on, who uh -huh. you made it locally yeah. as well. Um, and he came to the UK a bit later on than you, of course. But um, he didn't speak very good English either. Yeah. And he struggled and, and suffered a little bit of prejudice when he arrived. Yeah, Did you yeah, find yeah. that as well? Um, oh, mate. Do you know what? Because mm. back then Plymouth was a very, very multicultural, wide city. It was a yeah. non multicultural city. Nah, yeah, it wasn't. If I say I didn't, I'd be lying. But it's not as bad as everyone else says. Mm. If you get what I mean. Yeah. Being a street kid, I was always, always up to like, not no good, up to like doing like, I don't know, things like every 14, 15 year old would do. Just. Mm. Out. Just, just go out, out and yeah, have fun sure. with your mate and um it was fun. what area was you living at? Um Barbican, most Barbican of it. Now, yeah. <laughs> literally so on the hoe. Yeah. And then we went St. Jude and because it was still close. But um I didn't suffer because I kind of wanted to be one of the local kids. Mm -hmm. And I said I promised myself I'm not gonna go back. No matter what happens here, I wanna make this my home. Do you know I mean? Yeah. And we did, even though I was um, born in Iran and I was there till I was 14, I called this place home mm -hmm. because it's, they, people have been good to me. Mm -hmm. And I say this to everyone, Plymouth has been good to me. Mm -hmm. Very, very good. Awesome. And then tell us about how you um, got involved with a little bit of crime and ended up in prison. So what was oh, all about? mate. Nicking cars. <laughs> <laughs> That's one way to get in with the locals, isn't it? <laughs> in Plymouth. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, nicking cars. Fuck, my kids can hate this. But they know, they know this. That time my kids everything. Um, but I don't keep any secrets from them, I swear. Um, they know my ins and out of my life. <clears throat> Pardon me. But, yeah, mate, yeah, fighting, like, like, yeah, nicking guys, pinching the little things. And it, we went inside for fighting. And it was the most stupidest thing that we did in one night. It was just one night. We got bored out and about. You think you're tough. Offering a few people out. Before you know it, you get busted. You're like, oh, did I just get caught for that? <laughs> was it worth it? No. Now you got to do the fucking time. Now they it stays on your record for fucking ages as well. It's a pain, man. You can't get rid of it. But it definitely taught me a lesson because they said 80% re-offend. And I had to be in that 20% category. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to go back inside. Even though I enjoyed it, even though I got qualification, even though I look back and I'm like, okay, cool. I didn't have one bad day inside. You know? Even though there were days that there were days that we had fights. None of them was bad days mm -hmm. because we never caused a fight. Um, but I came out and I thought, okay, cool. I wasn't one of those guys, oh, fucking please, look at them. Nah, I was like, do you know what? I've done bad things and I'm inside and I'm doing my time. Let's go out and let's sort my shit out, you know? Um, then I had the opportunity to open up a restaurant because when you come out of jail with 
back then as well with Canal Record. You got to be honest when you go for job interviews. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No fucker's going to give you a job. Mm-hmm. Especially the young, like, eight, 19 year old lad. You know, you're like, nah, mate. No. It is a fucking horrible cycle, isn't it? You know, I've got mates that have <laughs> had a criminal record and mm-hmm. when they come out, can't get a job. Yeah, it's hard. Can't get a job. My, uh, my nephew was like that. He got done for some stuff and then he's not a bad lad. Come out. I just got nothing, man. Just nothing. And then, then he ends up fucking doing it again because he's just got nothing. Got no money. Yeah. Got no fucking prospects. You know? True. Can't even get on courses, mate, for college and shit. Yeah. You know? And he's only like 20. Mm. Most of those guys, the reason that I was so good with street kids, older like kids that didn't really have, some of them didn't really have the parents with them 24-7. The ones that kind of like didn't have possibly the right upbringing because it was like, yeah, you go out, go on the street, do whatever you want. But I didn't have my parents. My uncle was always working. So I think things would have been different if I lived with my parents. Mm -hmm. If I had my mum and dad like with me here, things would have been different. But living in a bed set um, by yourself and it's like, okay, cool, what should I do? I ain't going to sit in. I ain't going to stay. I'm just going to go out till like two, three, four o'clock in the morning. Then you miss the next day of school. Then you hang around with those kids. And I, so many of my good old mates are fucking made it in life. They genuinely have made it in life. The ones that was always out with me in the street, they're so successful now. Yeah. But, and I say to him, I say, boys, you all got good soul. You all got beautiful soul. You, we were all crazy back then, but we all had the courage and desire and the hunger to make a success. We were all, very confident that we could make it. Do you know what I mean? We weren't really academically good. Not many of us were good. I can, we were always mitching at school and stuff, but we had that close, tight circle that we knew, okay, cool. If you did brick lane, mate, do you know what? By the time you're 30, mate, you're gonna have your own business. Mm-hmm. If you did paint and decorating, by the time you're 34, whatever, you're gonna have your business, you're gonna branch out, you're gonna be successful. How many people do you know though that fucking like you said didn't have anything ac- academic wise and then they're fucking millionaires now? I know just through fucking building companies or yeah. whatever. I think yeah. you can't. <laughs> yeah, I know the graph in a good way. You know, I mean, fucking Literally they, they in a good fucking way. they fucking graph. They get it, yeah. you know, and they they just fucking work hard. And then when they're there, you just think, fucking hell, like how broken's our system? You yeah, know what I mean, all these clever lads. I know some clever lads. And they got fuck all. They ain't got a pot to piss in now. Yeah. You know, they've done uni. They've got everything. Yeah. Now they're fucking working for 30 grand a year. Yeah. And you got the lad who, who couldn't fucking read and write properly in a fucking massive house doing whatever. Got a bricklaying company. Got a fucking yeah. this company, that company. Honestly, I It's fucking admit, amazing. Yeah. It's fucking amazing. I would say like um, people's skills. What we had was, I know we were living trouble with makers back then, but in a nice way, like people were like, oh, you guys got a bit of charm or you guys are troublemakers or you guys are like, just make sure you like to turn it down and nip in the butt sometimes if we were in the street and the neighbours didn't like, um, kind of like, like this, if you go know what I mean. But we genuinely were, we had a good art, if you go know what I mean. We were like, okay, cool. If someone's get bullied, that kid's going to get slapped. Do you know what I mean? And we, we were in like decades of the community, if you go know on, I mean. we were just out there, didn't want to go to school, but out there having fun. We just wanted, we almost wanted to fast track our teenage years to get to the adulthood, mm-hmm. to make money. And But our life skills, our people skills, I call it, was spot on from a very young age because I didn't have any problem talking to like people towards my age when I was 14, 15, because that's the sort of guy I was. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wasn't afraid, and that's the beautiful thing. I talk to everyone and anyone. I've done from very young age that, yeah, I don't care what you do for a living, but I'm comfortable talking to you. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? And that's part of the reason quite a lot of my mates that weren't good academically, that's why they got businesses now, because the people skills so good. Mm-hmm. If you like someone that... And if the products might not be the best, if you like them as a person, you deal with them. Mm-hmm. You you want to do business with them. I swear down, yeah. you genuinely do. I mean, for us, it's different, but for all the other trades out there, as long as you like that likable person and people like your company, mm-hmm. you're like, do you know what? I want to deal with that guy. I want to give my business to this guy. Mm-hmm. Do yeah, you know what I mean? People buy from people, don't they? 100%. 100%. Yeah. Massive believer of that. Yeah, true. And then, 
when you got nicked and you were looking at jail time, like where was your head at then? Because obviously when you were in jail, in hindsight, you obviously got some qualifications and yeah. now that's led to where you are now, which is yeah. amazing. But as like a youngster at that point, facing jail, were, were you scared or? Do you know what? We had no fear. Okay. As a teenager, I got, I, do you know what? I'm scared of heights. I got, I'm fucking, <laughs> I got fear about fair things in life now. Yeah. But back then we were fearless. Yeah. We were fearless. We didn't give a f- flying monkey about fucking what we do and what we go up to. He just came in and did it. But now I think, okay, cool. Looking back now, 100% you would do things differently. Yeah. You know, going inside was pretty much at tough times to start with because I had to tell my mum. Mm. She was my best mate. Mm. She still is. My kids and my mum were the three greatest things that ever happened to me in my life. I told my mum I'd gone to private school. She goes, what do you want <laughs> I said, mum, I was so, so that's bright. One, that's one way to put it, right? <laughs> I was so bright. They put me to private school. So it's like, Matt, where are you calling me from? I said, mum, in this private school, they, they allow me to call you once a week on a Friday. So because I was doing catering and I was working in the main kitchen, I got to know the governor of prison really well. And he said, mate, what can I do for you? I said, mate, my family live 5,000 miles away. I need to call my mum once a week. He goes, why? I said, because she don't know I'm in prison. He goes, didn't you know? He goes, no. I said, I would like to speak to once a week. He said, you could speak to maximum 30 minutes. So that 30 minutes, do what I mean, but just one phone call. I said, okay, cool. So every Friday, I used to go to this basic room and phone my mum up. First time I called, she goes, man, where are you calling me from? I can't get hold of you. Why are you not answering the landline? I goes, yeah, yeah. You spoke to uncle? Yeah, yeah. He said, you're away studying. I goes, yeah, yeah, mum. Remember how good I was at maths? Remember how good I was at science? They literally seen something in me. I've gone to special school. Not a special fucking need, but like special <laughs> school. <laughs> she goes, man, where are you? I need to call you. What's the number? For me to call you. I said, you can't call. Is that, it's, it's like literally so restricted here that you can't call um oh, I could call you she goes okay cool so every Friday you're going to call me yeah I should call her talk about everything and I was always thankful to the governor and to the people that kind of look after me and I always give him extra portion of fucking shepherd's pie or fucking <laughs> better chicken or whatever um, I come out fine she didn't know anything about it um, 12 years later Someone grasped me up to my <laughs> no, mom. Fuck you, right. <laughs> For 12 yeah. years, my did she mom didn't know. She cried. Oh, did she? She cried loads. She cried. She said, I would have come to the UK and picked you up. She said, did you, not, did you not get a chance to come back? I said, yeah, when I was in court, they said, you could get deported. Was that what they said? That's, that, that, that's what it was. They said, you could get deported. Do you want the Iranian embassy to know you're here? <coughs> or... Do you want to go to jail and come out and do whatever after? I was like, okay, cool. We can't make that decision now because um, I've been here like four years. I don't want to go back to Iran. So in my head, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, what should I do? What should I do? I'll go back to Iran and that's a one-way ticket. I was about to say, yeah. That's a one-way ticket. You ain't coming back, Elia. They won't let you back I ain't in. coming back. I was like, okay, cool. Or just ride it. Mm-hmm. So I thought, now I'm going to ride it. I'm going to ride it. And then... When I come out, when this 12 years went by, my mom was like, Matt, did you go to prison? He goes, yeah. She goes, what's up? I can't lie to you, mom. My mom knew everything about that one secret because I knew how much, how much you were hurt. Because she said, Matt, the only regret I got in life is not spending enough time with you. And that made me cry because I was, I think I was, it was 19 years like, yeah, 19 years ago, my mom, like, so I was here for 19 years, six years ago, my mom passed away. Um, and in 19 years, we were like talking sometimes. We're like, mom, I've only seen you for like a year of that 19, not even a year. She used to come here now, like every other year for like a month or two. Um, I was like, mom, I do miss not spending time with you. And she goes, I know, me too. And then when she found out I was inside, she goes, mate, I would have come and got you because I didn't want you to go through all the pain. I was like, mum, I didn't go through pain. And that's why I am the guy 
who I'm today, and I always support her, and I always make sure that I got her back, and she didn't have to pay for anything. And even when we did the festivals and the stuff, she had to do, I'll never forget, one of the riders' requirements for Snoop Dogg was Persian rice. I'm shut up fucking making Persian rice. I can make rice, no more rice, whatever. I was like, Mum, this requirement that we got for Snoop Dogg's riders' requirement, it says Persian. My mum was the best cook. I said, this is Persian rice. Can you cook it? Joe from Boardmasters when Stephen was catering to Plymouth, cut the fucking Persian rice for me and then take it back there. I was like, Mum, it was a big thumbs up. You know, they love your Persian rice. <laughs> I was like, Mum, you know what? She was, ah, she was the best. I could tell so many stories about my mum. But that one thing that made her cry literally made me realise, you know what? She was that one person that believed in me. Mm -hmm. My dad didn't. My siblings supported me. My sister especially loved my sisters, but my mum was that one person that said, Matt, I know by leaving you behind, you're going to have a better life. Um, because she knew I, was, I would work hard from grafting, hustling from a young age. She said, I know you're going to graft and you're going to work hard and you're good because people like you. Um, you're not like, I don't think about making money when I, run my business 24-7. I don't. Money, I think, and that's... I think money becomes a byproduct of being successful, yeah. doesn't it? Like, yeah. if you're doing things the right way, money follows. Yeah. You know, if you're helping yeah. people, money follows. We talk about that sort of stuff that, all the time. Danny. If you do the right things, it all happens. 100% massive believer in that. I don't need to worry about it. People worry about that first, so the ones that fuck up. Mm. You know, because then they're like, money-driven, money-driven, money-driven. Mm. And then everyone fucking sees that stuff as well. You know, you think, how many people have you seen? You're just saying you're after money, mate. Fuck mm. off, you know? Mm. Whereas if you're doing it for the right reasons. Mm. Um, you nailed it, you nailed it. And I I always say, like, people say, mate, you could charge more. I go, why do I want more? I got things I'm happy with. My, I, my kids' health, boom, come first. My team, I look after them well. And we got a tight team. And the community work, boom, we're there. And I think why they want more, we open four days a week at Fuel. I wish I know what I know now, 20 years ago, because I I think, yeah, when I used to do six, seven days solid, my mum was like, mate, spend time with family. Spend time with family. Family comes like, yeah, yeah, mum, let me, let me, let me work, let me work. Anyone called in sick, Maddie went in. And then marriage broke down. And you're like, cool, okay. Fair enough. Now I look back like Matt, you worked loads. But now I realise, especially the last four years, post-COVID, we're like, you know what? Four days is plenty. I'm happy with four. Four days is, gives me enough time. I see my team four days a week. They see their family three days a week. And we got a hell of a balance. And I I see my kids a lot. We be good. Me and my ex are good. We Split custody and be be so good. And I I get all of that from my mum because she was always great believer meant enjoy today. Do you know what I mean? She wasn't she wasn't the type of person that would save a lot of money. She would give it to the most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. She would care like for people that needed the most. And I see everything that I do is all pretty much what she taught me. That I don't need a lot to live. Um, I don't need all the fancy cars and all the like big arts and stuff. We want to build good memories, me, kids, team, family, you know? And that's why we do so many like community work because we enjoy the journey, you know? I can't do, if I did it by myself, I won't enjoy as much, mm -hmm. you know? And I say this to everyone. And that's why the marathons or half marathons or climbing the mountains and all that, um, is so much more fun when we do it with a team and we're raising more awareness, mm -hmm. you know, and we're bringing everyone together. And it's, it's been a big part of success for the business. It's almost like people support, support me without me even trying to tell them, I need to make money, I need to make money. Like you said, money comes. Honestly, money comes. You do good things, you believe in your product, and you're new. Genuinely trust yourself that you're going to work hard and believe in what you put on a plate in our industry. 
people will support you um, no matter what, you know? Yeah, no, that's completely true, mate. Tell us about how you ended up catering for some of these musicians and these stars oh, then. How did that happen? Do you know what? We literally didn't even think um, it was, we, we would do anything like it. So I love live music. I'm a mad fan of live music. I'll have a drink or two, um, or three or four. <laughs> <laughs> I could handle my drink. I could handle my drink. Not really. But I think with catering, sometimes you don't expect things happening. Like if you get taken an opportunity that comes at you in life, um, then things will happen. You're like, okay, cool. This is nice. This is different. I always said, Sometimes thing gets a bit boring when it's same shit every day. So we had to try something new. My mate called me up because I met. I'm going on tour with Ben Howard. Do you want to come? I was like, cool. Fair enough. Let's go. So we did a tour with him. We went in London and then the festival organisers were like, we really like your food. I mean, you like the, with basically what you've done here. We used to like get like a, a normal room and turned into like a little restaurant, a pop-up. Didn't matter if it was at O2 or if it was an arena in Manchester, if it was in Newcastle, whatever. So like, give us a kitchen, give us an area, we turned into a pop-up restaurant. And everywhere we went, we talked about why we do the community work. Um, from an early stage, obviously the first couple of years, Scarlet wasn't diagnosed with type 1. Um, and when we did get dark, when she Scarlett did get dark, we always shared that message everywhere we went. We did Ben Abbott and then festival organisers saw what we did. They wanted us. So we went to do backstage festival catering for three different festivals. Most beautiful time we ever had. And with that, we were on tour in London 02, backstage catering. And I had a phone call from my ex saying Scarlett's not well. I said, okay, cool. What do you want me to do? She said, you need to come back. I said, I got a job. I got two more days. I need to cook two more days for this artist. Um, so can I not stay? She goes, mate, get the team to do whatever you got to do. You need to come back. Got a coach back to Plymouth and got back at 6 a.m. And that's why I always say, like, you can't miss. If I miss that, I will never forgive myself for the rest of my life. If I put business first and thought about, fuck, this artist might not be happy if I'm not there. Do you know what I mean? But I didn't know what Scarlett was going to get diagnosed with. Mm. So I was like, guys, you two need to stay. I'm gone. This is what you got to do tomorrow. Please, please, please um, make sure you deliver. Got back at six, eight o'clock, Derford. She was, um, she was in a bad way for 36 hours. She was in a bad way for 36 hours. They, in fact, told us if we didn't take her in on Friday, 30th of November 2012, and took her in on Saturday, the chance of her staying alive would have been 50%. That's how long her pancreas wasn't working for that her body was almost shutting down that she had so, she was so unwell, she lost so much weight and she wasn't herself. And the doctor, all he said to me was, when I took her on a Tuesday before I went to London to do the job, the doctor said, your daughter's got terrible twos. You know what it was like? Cough, better, losing better weight. She might be whinging. She might be weeing a lot. These are all the signs of terrible twos. So I'm like, mate, okay, cool. I believe the doctor. As we all do. As we all do. So I said to my ex, I said, she said, did you take Scarlet to the doctor? She said, yeah, yeah, the doctor said it's just terrible twos. The weed, losing weight, binging a lot or screaming and uh, little brother and stuff. Yeah, she's just got a little cough. Cool. So can I go to London to do this job? Yeah, go. We didn't know the signs. We didn't know. I didn't know what type of diabetes was back then. And I, I genuinely, uh, I always tell people, make sure you do your own test. Make sure you look for signs. Make sure you don't make the mistakes that we almost did. 
by leaving her too late. And I'll never forget when she come back to being normal again. The first day she was out, it was the most beautiful day ever. I was like, I can't believe I got you back to being normal. Even though we're gonna prick a finger, we're gonna jab the insulin, but I've got my daughter still. Yeah. Do you mean I got my daughter? And then when they said to me, like, I met this is a lifelong condition. I said, no, nah, we need to change that. I need to give the Taiwan community a hope that there is, there's a cure. Might not be my lifetime because I'm as old, I'm old as fuck. But um, but in my kids' life, my Scott's lifetime, there'd be something that they'd be like, Do you know what? It was worth raising money and awareness for because things changed and things improved. When we did that, every time we went and did catering for an artist, festivals, we always wore um, a JDR of type 1 diabetes. And everyone asked, what's that for? In fact, I got 52 type 1 diabetes shirt, the blue with the JDR of shirt. I used to wear them every day, all the time. He got to the point, Scott goes, Dad, can you wear something different, please? <laughs> I swear to God, for years, I, every day at work, I wore that. They sent me a pack of 50 and few people give me a couple of t-shirts. That's, that was just because I wanted to raise awareness. I was still wearing that again, but the community is so big now that the, the, the vest, the blue and white vest that we wear is pretty much everywhere at any events that we rock up to. And it's, it's good. It's good. That what we need, um, we need to keep, keep it going, you know? Um, but yeah, that festival catering was fun. But at the, for the time being, we put, we put in all our time and effort into fuel, which we kind of believe is the right thing to do. Yeah. Raising awareness and building a strong community for something that is very, very, very important to me and to the loved ones around me, you know? Yeah, we'll definitely come on to the diabetes stuff in a second, mate. Before we do... Did you manage to meet any of the, the artists or celebrities? Yeah, all backstage. Yeah, everyone, everyone. Um, Paul, who was who was the who was the worst and, and the best person you met? I think we had. A, I think. Oh my god, they were all good to us because we were given, given them extras. So if, uh, you, vaccines. If the vaccine said I want soup, I'm like, good. Give me a couple of hours. I'm gonna go knock up soup for you guys. And then if 1975 said, I want a fucking barbecue in the beach, to start, I said, fuck off, because I didn't know who to wear in 2013. <laughs> I'm a big fan of theirs now, but... I was like to say, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm a big fan of theirs now. So they're like, we want a barbecue in the beach. I was like, I'm not cooking barbecue in the beach for you. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is our setup. So we did a portable barbecue. We gave them our meat. And Matty Healy and all them, they just came and collected it, went to the beach by Watergate Bay, kicked themselves, whatever. But no one knew who to wear. They just thought this... But back then, they were just um, just starting up. Snoop Dogg, they were good. Um, I think Maxi from Faithless, God bless him, passed away last year. He was just, he's like, I just want liquid. I was like, okay, do you want smoothie? He goes, no, I want Stella. I go, cool, I'll make <laughs> sure I go get you Stella. So um, he didn't want food. Um, we had the guys from Rudimental, um, one of the managing people, he was a fruitarian, which I've never dealt with a fruitarian. The fuck is a fruitarian? I don't fucking know. So that's what he just eats fruit? Yeah. Fruit and veg, but just no honey, nothing. Just, yeah, fruitarian. I was like, okay, cool. What fuck me. Shark. I know. we done it all. I know. Fruit, that's, fruitarian. That's I fucking know. Needs me. Um, we had it all, but we had it all. We had, um, <laughs> <laughs> fuck me. We had an artist that wanted us to do, to um, give him sweet card, like a pick and mix stuff. I was like, cool. No problem. Pick and mix. Um, we had to make sure we supplied enough champagne. We had to make sure we supply oyster to fucking set an eyes that we can't say, but it's just, you're like, fucking why oysters, man? Do you know what I mean? But we did it because if we didn't, they wouldn't have performed. It was <laughs> really? written in a contract. <laughs> if don't perform, and then account, if we so. didn't perform, obviously I wouldn't have got fucking paid. Mm. So, and we had a big team. We used to take a team of like 16 of us, 16. Honestly, Dan, that uh, ball master was like Tim 16 backstage. But the beautiful thing was, we finished at half eight and the headliners were at nine. Nice. So we all got to see the headliner at least. And we used to party till like four or five in the morning. 
I caught so many of my staff sleep in the toilet, locked themselves in, <laughs> and then they used to get in, shower, and stand next to the grill or fry like half asleep, seven o'clock cooking <laughs> breakfast. But honestly, um, they were they were good, good, good times. But lately, we've been working with something then is 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 I think, yeah, the next big fucking artists that are gonna come out from um, UK to kind of like explode. So yeah, we've done a job for him recently, only like um, three day work at Newcastle and that was good fun. But um, took the staff up, we had a couple of nights out in Newcastle, fucking good night out. Yeah, it's a good night out in <laughs> Newcastle. You've been out in Newcastle. No, I've been mate, up on it's North, fucking mate. quality, mate. Another stag dude with, um, oh, what's she called? Fucking, this big fat bird who fucking does fish and chips and she sits on people's faces. Oh, I've talked about that before, but I still go over that again. It's, it's fucking <laughs> disgusting, but it was fucking funny. Did you get her for a stag? <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. So my, my mate had, uh, had a for her, mate. It was fucking, it was horrendous. We couldn't go anywhere like that because our manager, Becky, that means it was four of us, but um, because we had her with us, we couldn't really go to, yeah, places that it was inappropriate for a lady to go to. <laughs> <laughs> From what, what he said last time about it, mate, you, you probably dodged the bullet there. Seriously? So, yeah, oh, I mate, complain, we, mate. we had like a rented a, like a little flat. Seriously? Yeah, they rented a little Class. flat across the way. We stayed in a fucking like a youth hostel type thing. Uh -huh. It was fucking shit out. And then across the road, we rented a flat. And then this fucking stripper gram come in. Grottogram, isn't it? Grottogram. Oh, yeah, mate. Called, mate. She's fucking huge. Wow. It's not that, mate. She just purposely stinks. Yeah. <laughs> Fish and chips. Fish and chips is my favourite food, you, you, you know. You'd, you'd have seen her on Facebook it, about mate. five years ago. Yeah, but fish yeah. and chips is my favourite food. Oh, it won't be now, I said, mate. I don't have my wedding. <laughs> you won't fucking like I it. I my wedding. <laughs> I swear to God. It's so good that I don't have my wedding. Yeah. Yeah, main course of my wedding was fish and chips. I love that shit so much. No, after what you just said there. <laughs> yeah, sounds like some fun times you had there, mate. So what was your company called? Uh, what's the company called that you sort of have working with with those sort of things? Oh, mate, we used to call them. Um, remember we had Bed Restaurant yeah. back in 2004. This April will be 20 years since started that shit, man. It's mad. Our time's gone. Um, so we had Bed and we just took Bed on tour. Yeah, okay. You know, um, and anyone who's in Plymouth, kind of like my age, they know... They would bring you on wine restaurant. We used to have done bread and salt, but we can um bed was good days. So many of my mates had the first dates there. Yeah. Stitched so many of my mates up. And we used to have for about six, seven months, we used to have a double bed in the restaurant. Then when you phoned up, it got so popular they'd be like, Can we book a bed? I was like, Of course you can. So people used to book a bed. Um and then we're like, guys, I know you booked it, but can another couple get on a bed as well? They just want to sit the other end of the bed. And then before you know it, they were snogging. I was like, this shit is getting serious, you know. It's turning to more like a swinging club yeah, wait, wait a than a fucking thing. You need to go back a step here, mate. <laughs> so your restaurant bed had beds in it? One double bed. Okay. That was like carried and off. That when you booked, you're like, mate, do you want a table for two or do you want to... The bed is not booked out. You could book a bed if you want. So what, you would eat in the bed? Yeah, just put on a tray, just eat in the bed. Okay. And then when bed was <laughs> when the when that one bed was booked out, yeah. The next couple that wanted a book bed, we're like, okay, guys. Uh, by the way, bed is booked out. You could grab a table, but when you finish your meal, if we ask a couple to book the bed, and if they're still in the bed, you could just go on as well. I swear down, there used to be like. <laughs> <laughs> I was what like, the fuck? That bed, and it used to be a laundrette, not street called Hogay laundrette. Um, I was like, the guy's like, mate, you're back again? I goes, yeah, this, these sheets need washing, mate. Again. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, they need washing. So indirectly <laughs> turned into a swingers club. <laughs> Literally. And we used to go to this nightclub underneath Continental Hotel, a little club called Barra, and we used to go there, and the guy's like, met, back to bed for after party, fuck yeah. And then, we used to just crash up. Then next morning, wake up upstairs with staff change room, have a shower downstairs, open up for breakfast, hanging on my ass. But then all the people that I went out with, they kind of supported me. Business wasn't doing that great, but I was having fun while I was enjoying the hospitality hours because it's unsociable hours, it's shit hours. To everyone that does it, most of it is shit. 
like social life as well because you're working where everyone else is having fun. So I need to make sure when I finish work, I go out, catch up with all my mates and then have an after party down my place and they were good times, man. Don't regret any of them. Don't regret any of them. <laughs> what do you mean? Oh my god, that's funny, man. I was I was going to ask where the name Bed came from, but now I know. Yeah, so, I know. Uh, I know. <laughs> I know. My brother in bed stayed in bed, and then we kind of like closed it. We like so many good memories. I mean, yeah. so many good memories. And it was just every time I speak to mates, like, mates, was that your was that your best? It's like, mm, I think it was a good time, but I think fuel is mm. to me. Fuel is like, yeah, yeah, kind of like, yeah, one that I. I love a little bit more because of what we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. The community part. Yeah, let's, let's come on to that a little bit more then. So type 1 diabetes. So obviously there's there's a couple of types of diabetes. Mm -hmm. um, type 1 is obviously the autoimmune condition. Uh -huh. So your body attacks itself, destroys the cells that produce mm -hmm. insulin um, and typically develops in childhood. Yeah. So I think they used to call it childhood diabetes. But we've had a guest on who developed it at 28. So yeah. it can happen at yeah. any point. So back when you kind of touched on it already, but when your daughter obviously went in the hospital and you were told that she had type 1 diabetes, did you know anything about it at that point? No, not at all. Nothing at all? No, at all. Because I think literally diabetes, I thought, okay, cool, maybe you um, need to take these few tablets and it goes away. Mm -hmm. I was like, guys, you're telling me this is a lifelong condition. It can be because I know people reversed it. They're like, no, nah, that's type 2. Mm -hmm. Then we had to learn about type 1 and like okay cool so we need to change the shit we need to change the um the way people looked at type one because for years and years and years all i got told was mate this shit is obviously for life and i kind of didn't want to believe that i genuinely promised myself that i can't accept that i can't accept the fact that they're telling me this is lifelong. Surely there's got to be something. Surely there's got to be a cure. Or we work towards that and go as far as we can mm -hmm. to um, find a cure. Or at least make life so much easier and so much better. Um, but at first, I thought I could reverse this quick. Mm. Yeah, natu you know? natural instinct for a father, I oh, guess. Oh, so, mate. It? Yeah. Oh, mate. That's the hardest I've ever been hit and losing my mum. Mm. Um, yeah, that's the hardest I've ever been hit. In fact, it was so hard that when I phoned my mum up, she goes, mate, you're back in Plymouth before you work in London? Because, mum, you need to come. She goes, where? I said, come to the UK. It took us 16 hours to get to Plymouth from Iran. She got on the, the next flight over from my hometown, Mashhad, to London and from London to Plymouth. And she stayed for months to make sure we were right, you know. And she knew what I was going through because I was crying every day. I cried every day. I couldn't deal with it, you know. I was remembering myself, like, driving to Derford and back. And my ex was like, Miss, please stop crying. She was a, she's a tough one. Out of us two, my ex is a tough one. She dealt with it a lot better than I did. I got hit hard and, yeah, I just, yeah, it, it was, it, I went through the toughest time of my life then. I think with guys though, because we want to fix everything, right? Mm. Whereas women will typically just look after, yeah. they just want to care for them, whereas we got, we got to fix it. And mm. obviously you can't with that, so it must yeah. be so tough for you, mate. Mm. I think, I, I, yeah, it was like, there were days, there were weeks, there was mums that my ex was like, Mitch, you, you cry and I goes, yeah, listen, I can't. I can't deal with this. Because back then there was times that we used to force her to have like the pen, insulin pen. And then I thought, oh, mate, I don't want to hold my door down and then inject insulin. I really don't. I don't really want to prick a finger. Because you got to the stage that I was like, you can't get any more blood out of that finger. So we're going to move to that finger. When that finger's done, we're going to move to that finger. Then it was that finger, then it was that finger. I was like, cool. Then you want the, your fingertips to develop new skin mm -hmm. for you to be able to prick it again. But then the skin gets thicker. Mm -hmm. So you got to put the dialer on higher. That hurts more. Yeah. And you're like, okay, cool. 
that shit we need to change. So now is the Bluetooth. The way things improved in last 12 years is a lot more than last 100. Now it's Bluetooth. You Bluetooth um, your phone to the arm scanner mm -hmm. and then that Bluetooth to your pump. Yeah. And it's so much better. Is that what Jay had? Yeah, so yeah. we had we had a guest on, and he, funny enough, he's a nutritionist as well. Mm -hmm. um, but he had his mate sat in the corner with his phone monitoring his blood levels while he was Insane. on the podcast. It's yeah, amazing technology. Oh, that's crazy. Isn't it? Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's a fu it's a funny one, isn't it? Any autoimmune condition, it's just it's so hard to deal with because it's just it feels like just bad luck because there's not really any predictors of why why it happens. And I think type one diabetes. I mean, it's obviously been around forever, isn't it? I read something ages ago when I was studying sort of. Um, uh, like diabetes and that I think even in Roman times there was like physicians who reported people just kind of wasting away and they didn't know what was wrong with them uh -huh. and they commented that they tasted their wee and it tasted of sugar mm -hmm. so that tells you even back then there was like type 1 diabetes uh -huh. and obviously synthetic um Insulin was, I'm not sure, I can't remember when that was invented or uh -huh. discovered. 100, 102 years ago. There you go, thank you. Obviously, prior to that, it was a it was an absolute death sentence. Yeah, it was a killer. Yeah. So to think about, we talked about money earlier, mm -hmm. to think about this guy sold, four of them come up with this. Mm -hmm. So uh, Frederick Banton, when they invented insulin, Canadian got, they sold it for $1. They sold a lot for $1. Now, I think I read something the other day, is the fifth most expensive liquor. Um, liquid, sorry, in the world. The guys in America are fucked. That's how, because they have to pay a stupid amount for insulin. The guys in Canada, they, they pay quite a bit. But the Americans tra travel to Canada, to Karsha, to get insulin to go back. We're so lucky in the UK to get it for free. Mm -hmm. We're so lucky to get it for free in the UK. And I think if back then the guy sold the rights for one dollar, he didn't really want these companies to make millions of it. No, fucking That's why it's such a fucking shit time to be living that is these cunts are all making shit loads of money from it. It should be it should be illegal straight away. Jimmy you know I mean? hundreds and I think we are so blessed to have NHS mm -hmm. that we get support. We don't go without, I swear we don't go without. And this is why we keep doing what we're doing because we're like, we thank you for doing everything you guys do in NHS, all the researchers, all the professors and the doctors, all the study that goes behind the scene for make life better. But we could do our little thing by raising awareness, getting people to donate to 10 or five a year there because things are changing, things are changing fast. But to think that we have to pay for something that we have to survive, um, and if you can't afford it, um, you basically you die. You're like fuck. Surely, it may twenty first century twenty twenty four. I forgot to. I think nothing worse than have, having to worry about. Am I got enough? Have I got enough money for my next insulin? Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? I think a lot of those though, those types of diseases, autoimmune diseases and stuff, they do put premiums on the drugs, especially in America. They do it all the time. Supply and demand, isn't it? Yeah, and, and they make so much money. I know um, my mum's got an autoimmune disease called uh, Graves' disease, and um, it's a thyroid problem, so she goes overactive and over underactive. So it's, it's regulated by T4, which okay. is a drug so, which gives her thyroxin. So T4 is like cheap as chips, like really cheap. But for her to regulate, they need she needs T3 and T4. Um, about three years ago, they cut her off a T3. So she's been ill pretty much on and off for years now. The reason they cut her off T3 is because it went up 700%. The price was like over, I don't know, like £240 a month for the NHS to get it. So they completely cut it out. Um, it turns out that that company now got fined like billions for what they had done because there was no actual reason for the price increase other than to make more money. It's crazy. So all these people in, around the world, but around, especially in the UK, completely got cut off. So there's like thousands of people, obviously millions with mm -hmm. like thyrox, uh, thyroid issues, underactive, overactive. They couldn't get it. Just couldn't, couldn't get access to it. It's mad. It's not fair. I don't think, I don't, I don't, yeah, when you look at it, you're like, these guys, it does it for um, money. Um, 
You think you right in the head? Yeah. Do you just know, you yeah, right yeah. in the head? Who does that to someone? Like, she's mean? been miserable because yeah. of that. You know what I mean? Genuinely, mean? can't get her bed, can't do this, can't do that. You know, fucking all sorts of fucking problems. And you think doing that to someone for a few quid. Uh-huh. Like, and yeah, yeah. not just her, all these women, uh-huh. all these people uh-huh. everywhere doing it for what? For what? For a few quid so you can have a bigger house. Yeah. That's it. You know what I mean? You're not, you're not, mm. so you're not struggling if you're on Mate. shares in a pharmaceutical company. Oh yeah, you know what oh, I mean? No. Nah. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's just doing it for bigger greedy fuckers, you know? Yeah. And greed, fuck me, man. Loads of people want more. They got loads, but they want more. Yeah. And there's loads of fuckers out there that want more. And they're like, you got, man, you got enough. What are more? But, um, yeah, I've always said, like, it's just, is what you got and a few people around you are good. And I don't want my daughter to grow up like that. You could have done more to raise awareness and funds. You could have done more to spend time with me. You could have done more to like this. That's why I know we talk about Taiwan now, but business-wise, Christmas, New Year's and that, we don't open. We shop for 10 days. We're like family first. Mm. Why do I want more? Do you mean I'm happy with that? I'm happy with my little free bed flat that I live in. Do you mean yeah. I'm 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 happy? My kids are happy. Do you mean and I'm not greedy? I don't really um I'm not a money chaser. Do you mean I'm I'm grateful, very very grateful and humble with the little thing I got in life, and and I'm blessed, and I will thank God for everything He's given me. And thank him for just putting me in the right path mm-hmm. to be able to do what I do and not to be that guy that you just said, want to be that greedy cunt to fucking want more uh, money in life. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And when you talk about money and sometimes money changes a lot of people, I swear to God, it, it changes a lot of people, you know? Money makes people do fucking stupid things. Yeah, big fucking time. Fucking stupid things. Big right? time. Things that you never think people would big do, they do for money. My little lad tells me, he goes, Dad, if I have a business, I'm going to deal with it better than you. Just like, why? He goes, because you don't charge enough, Dad. At the young age. That's how he tells you. <laughs> he said, you give so many things away for free. I said, see that guy, give him a free like, drink. He goes, yeah, why? I said, because he's going to put a tenner in my just giving page. Yeah, but don't give me free drinks. You could just pay a tenner. I goes, no, it doesn't work like that. Because I'm kind enough to give him a free drink or free bacon, bap or whatever. He's just put a 10 or a 20 quid in my just giving base. It's fine. He goes, yeah, if I run this business one day, dad, after you, I'm going to make shit loads of money. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true though, isn't it? Yeah. You, you get those traits from your parents and yeah. stuff. Yeah. My mom was exactly the same. She, she'd, she'd run a game shop and kids uh, would come in they ain't got much money. She'd yeah. go, oh, I'll take a game. Do this, do that. I know. And, and that passed on to me. You know, yeah. I used to be like it then and yeah. it does, doesn't it? Because it's, oh. it's nice to help people, isn't it? Of it's course nice. it's, you know, of course it's always it is. nice to help people if you can't help, you know? And obviously you get it from your mum. Yeah. Like, you get it from your mum. I don't know about anyone else, but when I talk to everyone, I okay, get, yeah, I get oh, anything that's good about me, I get it from my mum. And all the bad things are fuck knows. That's just me. So me. Does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, true, true. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's my dad. Yeah. yeah, it's my dad. Fucking hell, but. So at what age was your daughter when she developed it? Two? Two, say? yeah. Okay. Two very, very, very young age. Yeah, 12 years ago, so she's into her teens now. When did she like become aware that she was a little bit different? Do you know what I always said? You deal, like, diabetes has to deal with you. You don't deal with diabetes. And we had to change it from negative to positive. I said, remember, this type one thing, Scarlett, you need to make sure we control it, we battle it, we defeat it. We don't let it um, kind of like breaks us. Obviously, like anything in life, you have, so you have your ups and downs. And I've managed to like, see or hear from so many good type ones athletes out there or influential people that they're so good with it and they're like, do you know what? We don't let it knock us down. We don't let it um, kind of break us. Um, the negative impact it has, you almost don't even want to think about it. You just live for today, enjoy the journey and just make sure you live a good lifestyle and you have fun 
and you exercise and you eat well and just do normal things that someone without type 1 does and your life just be as good. It's hard to have type 1. Trust me, it's difficult. It's, they're all resilience. They're all tough individuals, anyone with type 1 out there because some people don't know the, the mood effects for people with type 1. And honestly, when they're low, when they're high, I read it now and I could see it now and I could notice it from miles away. But everyone that I get to speak to, I'm like, guys, be careful. Be careful because you need to be patient. You need to like listen to them when they highs or when they're low. And you need to make sure you kind of like, be careful what you say because they, they're not, if they're not functioning properly for like a couple of minutes, if the highs are lows, they need to, or sometimes if they're lows, you need to make sure you're there with your lucasate, with your juices, with your food. And if the highs, you need to make sure you, you kind of like deal with it in a correct way and not lose your temper. Um, and I have managed to get enough knowledge from Instagram, YouTube, whatever, to be able to keep giving that positive message to people, boys. And I think there will be a cure in, I would say in 15, 20 years. I've got, I know people are 89 years old and they got type one. And this old dear, the paint and decorator that works for us, his mum, she's 89. She's had type one for 54 years. But, She's normal. She's normal. So when people say type one, this type one's that. She's not the most like she's not your athlete, but she's lived a healthy lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So when people are like, oh, do you know what? The side effect is like, I don't even think about a side effect. This type one's got to deal with um, um us because we we be here to like tackle it in the right way. We do everything we can to have have as normal possible life that we can, mm -hmm. you know. Um, yeah, you can't let it. You can't let it defeat you. Honestly, it's it's, it's horrendous out there. Yeah. Some that some days we had we had incidents that they're not nice incidents, but we managed to deal with it, mm -hmm. you know. And she knows she got so many good mates around her that they know how to deal with it. When she's low at school, her mates are there with biscuits or with juice or whatever. She's got so many top quality friends that like got her back that we almost like, we are, she actually goes to school that I went to and a couple of the teachers are my mates from when I went back, when I went to school. Um, Lipson, so they know, not that they care more, but they are careful because if because of a condition, if she needs to be like in a medical room, she knows, okay, cool, boom. Then she needs to be dealt with pretty quickly. And I drop everything. There's been times halfway through the service, I feel I've gone. But I've been by myself and me and a pop watch me and a company chef. I was like, guys, stop the service. The sole job I got, my ex, like, because she works with um, she's a social care work, uh, social worker, so she worked. She couldn't drop. She does as well. She she's so good. But I could drop everything. It's my own business. I can like fucking give him refunds. Mm -hmm. Because I need to go to school. Make sure I take the insulin pen, or make sure I take Lucasate. Make sure I take food. Scarlet's number. Make sure I go and pick her up. I'm so sorry to all my customers that I let you down, but I need to go. I get. I literally. Um, get there as fast as I can and because you got it you got it because you don't want to miss it you know what I mean you want to you want to make sure you're there but um, it's yeah it's been it's been a challenging but it's been um, life changing um, but we, we're dealing with it diabetes like listen we can't let it defeat us mm -hmm. he has to he has to diabetes has to deal with us and that's what I always say to people. I swear, mate, we are tough motherfuckers. I swear to God, we they need to deal with us. 
to me. And that's the message I said to all the communities, Taban communities out there, um, or to any sort of um, illness that pretty much people got. Mate, it's easy for me to say it because I don't have it, but I swear I see the pain. But you're still dealing with it. Though. Yeah, man. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're still dealing with it, mate. It's 100%. Not, it's not one of those things that nah. just fucking, it's probably <laughs> saying shit, but seeing your daughter like that's fucking, it's so hard. And then having the, well, just having to deal with that every day for fucking yeah. however many years is, yeah. is yeah. Know, it's fucking hard. And that's hard. one of the reasons, Danny, I made sure I had my own business because I could pick and choose hours. Mm. I could be like, sorry guys, I'm like, close this day for whatever reason. Mm. So those three days, close those three days I got my kids, Sunday, Monday, Tuesdays. And I don't want them to grow up like that, you know what? Mm. When you had us, you're working all the time. So as a dad, I'm doing everything that I'm supposed to be doing, spending time with them, but I need to make sure they know I've done, I've done everything. Mm -hmm. I could, if you know what I mean. Caring is the most beautiful gift my mom gave me. Caring for people, no matter if my kids, people around me, is, I've been blessed with that. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think if anything that um, I would say to anyone out there, like I said, it doesn't have to be the chai, type one diabetes chai, any chai out there. You get people together, you care for that community, and the people's affected with that um, charity, they, 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 they appreciate it so much. When we do these marathons, these challenges, when you see different amazing charities, you're like, do you know what, this is good, you know? Mm -hmm. This is good. I'm glad everyone gets together to raise awareness, to um, raise a better money, to make life better for people who are affected the most, you know? Yeah. Um, and I would say that charity work is, my charity work is my is my best work mm -hmm. that I do. It's the best thing about us and is a, is a great feeling when you give back. Yeah, it definitely is, mate. Tell us about the work that JDRF do then. The research beyond everything that they do, they, they're trying to improve lives for type ones. It doesn't, means we'd be all chasing the queue, we're all chasing the dream, and the dream is that ultimate goal. And the goal is to find the queue. But they're making life so much easier and so much better. Now, it's, most people you see with that armor scanner now, mm -hmm. you know they got type one. Mm -hmm. So before if someone claps in the street, and if they had a hypos, you'd be like, mm, what's wrong with that guy? You wouldn't know, would you? Sometimes you wouldn't know. they think they're drunk. They say, yeah. Sometimes they think there's all sorts of stuff. Isn't it? Some people have tattoos now. Mm -hmm. Like they used to have tattoos, type 1 diabetes tattoos. But look, you can't expect a young child to have a tattoo. Do you know what I mean? So these arm scanners have been the best things ever happened. So 99% of people who got these arm scanners, they got type 1 diabetes. Mm -hmm. Some people have it for a health reason. Some top athletes have it. But then I'm not against that because I think they're still raising awareness. Because when some top athletes wear it, monitors the blood sugar level and then they see um, how they perform and stuff I think that the work that the JDRF do the reason we're so close to to that charity and the work they do is they they when I said earlier about hope they give me hope they give me hope about Q they give me like they, I'm hoping they're making my dream reality one day by finding a cure. We had a single biggest donation last year from the guy who owns the Red Row Housing Group. His son's got type one and he donated five million pounds to JDRF. Wow, that's amazing. Five million pound <laughs> check. Yeah, yeah. Because his son's got his son is nine years old or ten years old. And if you got going back to what we said, if you got the money, why not? Oh yeah. Fine. Why not? If we didn't have the money, if they JDRF don't have the money they won't be able to do all this research. Mm -hmm. These professors and these doctors and all these work, work, these guys work in the lab. Th that shit needs to be funded. And I think it's so important. It's so, so important to do what, everything you can. I literally believe that. To do everything. Don't leave anything behind. I'm at the age that 
I think I've got so many more marathons in me that if I don't do them, I will regret it when I'm 60, 70. So if I don't raise awareness now, if I don't raise money now, I can't do it when I'm old, old. Because I'm like, let's do it now because I've got my health. Mm -hmm. I could do it now. I've got amazing people around me that we become a family. I don't even call it community. We become a family. That we taking 28 individuals from Plymouth to Barcelona in three weeks, three weeks today to the Barcelona Marathon. I think 18 out of 28 never done a marathon in a lifetime. <laughs> and they stepping up to do it. It's fucking hard. Man. Some of them are like meant to be doing it. We want to have a good time. We want to smash this marathon. We want to raise loads of money for charity. It's very, very, very close to you. And so many people bring in family members, moms, dads, brothers, sisters, girlfriends. The plane, the flight that we Catching over Saturday the 9th, 7 o'clock uh, flight from Bristol. Majority of the flight is the people from Plymouth mm -hmm. with all the JDRF, JDRF teeth and JDRF vests and JDRF banners on. We're taking over a plane. So six months later, we're going to be, be taking over Amsterdam. So when we did Plymouth 12 years ago, it was me and one other. Mm -hmm. um, lady called Rebecca. She's an amazing, amazing mum. His door's got type 1 and she's been unreal in Devon and Cornwall area to raise awareness and funds for JDRF. And then we grew this team and I said to a few people and we set up a few before you know it, this year we got over 60 people running. And it's only a beautiful thing and if you see more and more people caring about what we care about and they see what I go through and I'm not scared of crying. I cry when I get emotionally hit. Every year at London Marathon, I cry. I do so many marathons, but the one in London is the first one I ever did for JDRF nine years ago. Every year I finish, I cry like a baby, man. I cry and I film it and I get donations in. And I'm like, guys, please donate because I don't do this for me. I do it for this fun, uh, foundation. I do it for this charity that's doing so much. I could be in bits, but I still do it. We've done marathons, we done one marathon with no training, zero training, and the deal was 500 quid to JDRF. I promise my mates, two guys, that if I don't train, it was London number five, four years ago, I think it was, I didn't train at all. I was crippled after my 15. My legs were fucking gone. I walked most, I did in four and a half hours, four hours and 25, but I raised the most that year, even though I failed to get a good time, even though it was my worst time ever. When people saw my video, they're like, Med, you in bed, your legs are gone. I said, I don't recommend it to anyone. <laughs> yeah, but I, I did it for raising more money. Mm -hmm. And that meant so much to me because my mate delivered. My mate both of them paid 250 each. And then everyone else were like, fair enough. And I had to go, social media's like, guys, don't do marathons with no training. I wouldn't recommend it. My people could do whatever they want, but it's not good to you, buddy. Do you know how much you've raised for charity? Mate, we raised shed loads, man. We raised thousands. Like this year alone, we've been doing it for 12 years. Let's do it for average. This year alone, we're on 13,100. Then we close it. And the next year, we open up a new Just Giving page. So Amsterdam, we're going to close the account in October, then we're gonna have a new one. We're coming up with a new challenge every year. And we keep adding marathons. Um, but the biggest challenge we got, boys, is we're doing 12 ultra marathon in 12 days for 12 years since Scarlett got diagnosed for type one diabetes, with type one diabetes in November. We were gonna do it this month, but we postponed it to November because November is Type 1 Diabetes Awareness Month. Mm -hmm. And because we're going to do 12 by 12 by 12, is we spoke to the charity and they said they could broadcast a little bit. They could raise loads more awareness for the foundation if we did it in that month. Mm -hmm. And to us, it meant 
more because we're going to finish it on the day that Scarlett got diagnosed, 30th of November 2024. It'd be 12 years. So it's not an easy challenge. It's definitely one that I feel nervous when I talk about it. Fucking up. Yeah. <laughs> Can you say 12 <laughs> ultra marathons? 12, anything over 27, 26.2 is ultra. So we're going to do 27, 28. A day? Every day. For 12 days? For 12 days. All in Plymouth. Fuck that, mate. Are you doing it all, all in Plymouth? Plymouth? All in oh, Plymouth. Oh, amazing. Do you amazing. Mean, so, okay, it's not when you think about the hills, though, is it? <laughs> I was about to say, yeah, fucking hell. We're going to do couple. So we're going to start from a local businesses that supported us from day one. Amazing. So if a company supported us from a day one, we're like, boom. Can we do it? How many have you got doing it? So people are going to jump on and do 5K or do 10K. Some people are going to ride a bike next to me. It's the only race that I could do and have sponsors on my vest because all the other official races that we do is all for JDRF. We can't really put business's name on. But for the 12 by 12 by 12, we got pretty much businesses that want to go on our best and we're like end of the day they've been supporting us end of the day we want to make sure we give back to them and they will pay little fee to just be on the best but um, that's our toughest challenge yet um, and to finish on a day and the 12 years that Scarlett got diagnosed it means so much to us. so on the 30th of November 2024 is our last um, ultra marathon but we're excited mm -hmm. we're, um, we're very excited Is if I did a half marathon, I don't expect you guys to dig deep and pay um, good money to my just giving page. Half marathon is tough to do. I don't, I don't, I'm not going to say half marathon is not tough. But what I'm saying, what I put my body through and what I want in return from people is let me do these hard challenges. But in return, I do it not for me. I do it to raise money and awareness. So please donate to anyone's out there to and see me doing we're doing 20 marathon this year 12 of them are back to back ultras and I'm doing 8 different marathons around the world you're David Goggins mate no I made that go <laughs> <laughs> but um, I wish I had his bloody um, running skills mate I still haven't figured out how to fucking run but, um, <laughs> um, and I think is the only gift I got running is I can't do anything else to raise money I'm scared of ice if I jump off a plane people are not going to give me 13 grand and it's an individual thing mm. do you know what I mean but I like to do things as a team running's hard mate fucking mentally uh -huh. physically fucking uh -huh. emotionally isn't it I fucking uh -huh. hate running Yeah, I was uh -huh. the only footballer mate you hated running <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I think I'm the only Rapping runner suits me <laughs> I know I think I'm the only runner that actually don't enjoy running by myself. I don't think, I don't remember the last time I ran by myself. Mm. I love running with people and I talk all the time when I run. Even don't matter what pace it is, I talk. People are like, mate, you can shut up now. Because, mate, you don't need to say anything back. I just talk <laughs> because I get bored. I get bored of running. <laughs> I don't need the clarity. I don't need the headspace. But I enjoy when I run. I just talk, talk about random shit with people. Yeah, I think people need that though. Like, I'm, I'm the same as him. I, I'm not a big fan of running. I, I've I've did the Plymouth half once. Uh -huh. It was a reasonable time. It was under two hours, but I felt like my hips were going to explode. Yeah, I was the same. I, it, well, I've done it in COVID and lockdown. I was like, I was running ten k's like fucking every other day. I was like, oh fuck it, I'm going to do a, do a half today. Just left, done it. Fucking hell, mate. <laughs> my fucking legs and knees. Well, I tell you what, when I did the half, though, there were so many points where every fiber of my body was just saying, fucking just stop, mate. Oh, oh no. But the, the crowds and the people like kept me going. Uh -huh. so, yeah. And I think you hit so many walls. Yeah. You hit so many walls. And I think when your legs give up, my legs do give up sometimes. I think about mind never matters shit. Mm. And he's definitely, you got to run with your heart. You got to run for what you believe and the reason behind it. Honestly, there are times someone found a video of me. This guy in Amsterdam was running with, with a stick and he was do, trying to do sub three. And I didn't know I was in his video until someone found the, the other week. They're like, man, you're in this guy's video. I was like, what? And there was a moment, I think a mile nine or 10, 
I'm going with the sub three guys. I didn't do sub three, by the way. I I always run with my phone and I got a picture of my kids and my, uh, what's my wallpaper? And I'm looking at my thing and it goes, Matt, you had your phone on you and you were kissing your phone. I was like, and when I hit a wall, I kiss my kids. It reminds me why I do it. It reminds, it gives me a reason why I get up and do what I do. Um, because you almost want to pass that on to them as well to kind of like care. But I've hit so many walls. I've hit, so, I've had so many cramps. I had so many bad knees. But do you know what? What is it? Three hours, three and a half hours of your time? You're going to suffer? In my head, my door goes through it every day. My, and then but the, if you're going to look at it that way, you're like, mate, three and a half hours, four hours of your fucking time is nothing compared to what they go through. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, it's such a powerful motivator, isn't it? 100%. Yeah, yeah. 100%. And I'd say to people, I, I'm not the most, um, like, Mr. Motivator type of guy. I'm pretty, I don't really take many things that seriously in life. I like, I do things probably, but um, I kind of like to, I'm good at a few things and that's caring, giving back, my charity work, my people around me, but um, I'm up for good fun. I'm enjoying this journey. I, I am genuinely loving everyone around me. At a minute, I'm in a good place, you know, because people care for me and I care for them, you know. It doesn't matter, like, if it's my team at work, the team they run with, my kids. Um, but, and that's the message, and I, I say this, and I'm a great believer. Um, work hard, give back, do good things, be good, and make, before you you don't expect it, but you get a return to you, I swear. And that works in business, that works in charity, that works in the community, in anything you do in life, you know? Um, but yeah, man, it's good. So can't wait, three weeks today. Yeah. Barcelona. Okay, um, um, you've mentioned a few of, uh, few, a few times, mate. Obviously, locally people know exactly what you're talking about, but this this goes out to, to a quite a wide audience. Uh-huh. So how, tell us a little bit about Fuel real quick and how you leverage that to raise awareness as well. Uh-huh. I think we started because we needed to have a food that ticked every pretty much box when it comes to like a well-balanced meal. So we did, we started with meal prep. So we did what I cook. Recommended meal portion is 180 grams of pasta, whatever it is, um, one chicken breast, 75 grams of veg, whatever, um, and better sauce. So we did that and we thought, okay, if you eat this, you're not going to eat again for four hours, at least. So these well-balanced meal in a box that we did, meal prep, that's how we started fuel. And then it was good with people with type 1 because we made sure we kept our ethos. We still do our meal prep now. We are in our ninth year doing it. But the business changed so much because with meal prep, we haven't put our prices up. We put our prices up by one pound in, no, by, no it was 4.25, by 75p in nine years. So for me to be able to survive as a business, we had to do, we had to almost make sure we do our meal prep, but and that will never change until fuel's around. But we had to do the bar side. We had to do the event side. We had to kind of like do the old weddings and do the old takeaway, do the old restaurant service where we did normalish food, but do it healthy and make sure that side of the business makes money. So the meal prep, the fuel side where we raise money and awareness for type one is keep going. Um, and we've been doing it, man. We've been doing it, like I said, it's nine years and it's the, the community is getting bigger. The the popularity of the brand is is out there. We, like I said, we do the runs, we do the IROX challenges, we do the climbs, we do anything. And like I said, when you look at the page, we don't solely concentrate on um, just the food. It's all about kind of like 
getting being out there as a business that okay that's a restaurant but it's not they don't always shout about food mm. shout about a charity work shout about the runs shout about a gym session is 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 different to what your normal restaurant slash a food operator business would do like keep every post has to be food now nah. or every story has to be food now nah. to me is more community work I'd like to go there as well his food is fucking lovely yeah. like he's he's really underpaying it like he's not imagine how good his fucking food is Thanks, it is fucking man. lovely Thanks, it is man. lovely genuinely do you mean it's, it's, it's good because we build a brand with what we created and honestly we get so many people in day in day out we could open seven days a week but we don't four days enough and we don't everyone says it we don't charge enough but we are happy with that yeah. We're happy with what we charge mm -hmm. and the customers are happy with what they pay. And we build in that brand and we like trying to like be different to, and I'm, I'm and I always said I was crazy enough to live by myself pretty much from age of 14. Mm -hmm. And I'm crazy enough to do, to charge what I charge. My food, people are like, oh, I met you on the business. Mate, I'm, 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 I am genuinely happy. And if you're making enough to sustain your lifestyle, it's fucking, you know what I mean? Honestly, I don't want, like, people are going more. I goes, nah. Do you know what? <clears throat> we did a Valentine's nip that the other day. Two, uh, three courses and a bottle of wine, decent bottle of wine for 50 quid. We probably were the cheapest around. Mm. We did well. People are like, mate, you could have charged more. I said, I'm happy with that. You know, yeah, but as like um, you said, it's not it's not just about that though, is it? It's, it's very clear from this this conversation, I think, that it's it's so much bigger than just making the money, isn't it? Hundred percent. And I I love life. I, I genuinely do. And I, like we're going away with like with a team to do um uh, like a, whatever um few marathons. We're running from here to fucking Penzance in the, in the middle of summer. I'm not doing it by myself. I won't do it by myself. The people that care, the people I cared for. And I looked after. They're like, Madge, we want to give it back to you. Mm -hmm. And so many of them, they don't even have anyone with type 1. But they're like, Madge, because we care about what you do, we want to do. This idea of us running from here to Penzance, it wasn't my idea. People were like, Madge, do you want to do it? I was like, cool. If you guys want me to do it, I'll do it. Like, we want to do it for JJ. I was like, cool. Let's do it. We've got to finish in 24 hours. We do it. I don't mind. So, But if I tell people tomorrow, guys, I want to do... I'm still marathon. I put it in a group chat. I think one of your good mates, Liam, is coming along as well. Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah. he's yeah, coming along to Amsterdam. Yeah. So we're like, boom, he wants to come. Us. Before we know it, we got 19 si signed up so far in a week. You watch him out there, mate. All right. <laughs> <laughs> is it good? You keep, a, you keep a good eye on him. Yeah, he's got a good eye. <laughs> Might get lost. <laughs> we're all going to get lost there, mate. <laughs> we're all going to get lost in Amsterdam. I mean, I think not many of us will probably. Make a flight back. <laughs> I'll no, make sure. Lad, lad. They're all good. Yeah, they're all great lads. Yeah, a lot of them are, mate. I know, me, I know quite a few Liam of them. Liam is yeah. one of them as well. Good people with good art. I call them people that kind of like went through little difficult paths yeah, in life. Definitely. But they all got beautiful souls. It's not perfect, is it? To me, none of us are perfect. And we all got beautiful souls. And all my mates that we go into trouble before. When we're teenagers, they all got beautiful souls. They might not be you know, an average guy, that polite kid who got eight stars in that school, but they they had good arts, you know? And um, yeah, we got so many of them in our team. Yeah, that's great, mate. Where can people reach out to if they want to support? Oh, uh, mate, on our, fa um, on our Instagram or Facebook, we got a few followers. Um, Facebook and Instagram are Just Giving pages up. Every year we have a different Just Giving page. Um, so we, we hit a target. But we close it and then we set up a new Just Giving page for our challenges that we have every year. Um, and yeah, Facebook, Instagram, any social. What's that? Fuel, at Fuel Catering? Yeah, Fuel Catering. Yeah, Fuel Catering. Yeah, we'll, we'll, Facebook, we'll, Instagram. We'll put the links down below for your yeah. name. You know what I mean? And I think it's, um, it's good. It's been a hell of a journey and I hope people, I don't know. I thought my, my life has been kind of like, yeah, half 
interesting that people, when they listen to this, are not going to fall asleep <laughs> to me <laughs> because not many people are crazy enough to do the fucking things I've did in my lifetime. Um, but if I didn't take risk, I would have been back home in Iran, mm -hmm. to me, and um, probably be in prison in Iran still <laughs> for doing yeah. all sorts of crazy shit over there, yeah. you know? But now nah, Plymouth has definitely been a home to me. Mm -hmm. And um, in the community, they've been, they've been insane. And I think what we do every year, this, this, this year was our 10th year anniversary for working with the most vulnerable in the community. Liam came and helped um, this year because I didn't know him last year. Um, every Christmas Eve we get together and we pretty much give back to the shelters, to the housing um, community that say this person, that person, that guy, that, that family needs your support. We started nine years ago. I think this was our 10th year. Um, and we did 60 for Shekinah. This year we did 1,200 meals, just short of 1,200 meals. Amazing. So on Christmas Eve, when Liam was there as well, we did just short of 1,200 presents and 1,200 meals, two courses for, um, for the community. We couldn't do it just with our team, so we had to rely on our basic volunteers. So the day before, People were peeling spots. We took in 25 sacks of spots and more. We took in 45 turkey crowns. We took in like X amount of carrots and parsnips and stuff. You will see the vid uh, video. We've been kind of like inspired by the community work that the people behind the scene do all year round that we wanted to change. We wanted to give back one day a year and that's Christmas Eve. Because Christmas Day, most people spend time with their families. So Christmas Eve, we do that. And that's part of our fuel journey. Every year, people know fuel gets everyone together. Christmas Eve, Eve, we prep. And Christmas Eve, we get up at 6 o'clock in the morning. In the kitchen, we have all our volunteers. Someone makes the brownies. Someone makes a Victorian sponge cake. Someone donates hats, gloves, scarf. Um, sanitary stuff, deodorant, so every presence that people get is all essential stuff that they pretty much probably might need. Um, and then sometimes, quite a lot of times, we get postcards and we get like letters. They say, for the last seven, eight years, people at Salvation, Shekinah, Jill's Hostel, so many other hostels to name, um, Ham's House, they almost rely on that presence that they know they're at least going to get one presence here um, and they're going to get two courses on Christmas Eve. And when we did that, and that's this is why so many people cared about what i so passionate about, and that's JDRF. Because once you give back to the community, mm -hmm. people are like, oh, this guy cares about people around him. Mm -hmm. So we're going to care about what means so much to him. And you guys, I would highly recommend getting involved next year or this year. Sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's such a big, kids are welcome to come. But quite a lot of people got kids. They bring the kids along to wrap presents up, to put stickers on the boxes. Teach them at a very young age how important it is. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Because most people think, oh, yeah, Christmas is all about fucking presents. It's, it has the biggest fucking toy or whatever. Do you know what I mean? But um, that's, yeah, that's been part of a fuel journey from the start, as well as the type one stuff that we do, you know? And like I said, it's not just about the food, you know? It's, it's more to it than let's just do healthy food in the box. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, count us in, mate. You'd be good. Mate, appreciate, appreciate it, mate. Thank you, mate. Thank you for coming on, mate. Cheers, mate. Thank and you, mate. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah.